In this video, we consider whether the following statement is true or false. The statement is, context-free languages are closed under complement. Let's remind ourselves of what it means to be closed under complement. So, um, let's say if the context-free languages are closed under complement, it would mean that if L1 is an element of the set of context-free languages, then L1 complement is an element of the context-free languages, for sure, for any arbitrary L1 that's a context-free language. Okay, so that's what that statement would mean. So, in order to determine whether the context-free languages are closed under complement, we find that it is helpful to first show that the context-free languages are closed under union. So the claim is that context-free languages are closed under union. So we're going to give two very quick proofs that this is true, uh, mainly to prove that they are closed under union, but also to give you a little bit more practice of doing proofs of this sort. So I'm going to call this one proof one. Okay, we're going to use grammars to prove this. So let's let L1, L2 be elements of the context-free languages. So L1 and L2 are context-free languages. And we're going to have two grammars. So let's say that the language of grammar one is L1 and the language of grammar two is L2. So G1 and G2 are context-free grammars. Okay, let's define G1 is going to be a set of variables, we'll call it V1, sigma, set of terminals, R1, the set of rules, and S1, the start variable for G1. And let's define G2 as V2, sigma, R2, S2. Okay, and now we're going to construct G such that the language of G is equal to the language of G1 union language of G2, which is the same thing as saying L1 union L2. Okay, so for some technical reasons, the first thing we're going to do is ensure that V1 intersect, whoops, should be a V, V1 intersect V2 is the empty set. What we mean here is that V1 and V2 do not share any variables. Okay, we want to make sure that if we start a derivation that would have been from grammar 1, we're going to stay in that grammar. We're only going to use variables from that grammar. We don't want to allow uh, mix and matching, if you will, of variables from G1 and G2. Okay, so um, if not, we're going to do something very simple. Um, let's say for any variable that is in the intersection, we're going to replace all occurrences of V in V2 and R2. Okay, so what I mean is let's let some variable W be um, in the set of variables V1 and the set of variables V2. Then I'm going to replace W with a new variable that doesn't uh, appear anywhere, let's call it X in V2, and I'm going to find all occurrences of it that show up in any of the rules in the set of rules R2, and I'm going to replace W with X. Okay, so this is just going to make sure that these two sets are disjoint. Okay, and so we're going to form V2 prime and R2 prime. Okay, so if um, any of the variables did appear in the intersection, we do this replacement, we can just replace it in V2, and so V2 prime is going to be V2 with this variable being replaced, and R2 prime is going to be R2 with this variable being replaced. Okay? So that's the first thing we're going to do. 
Second thing we're going to do is create a new variable, s, which is going to be the start variable of g. Okay, so we're gonna have a new start variable. We're going to add a rule, s goes to s1 or s2. Okay, so this is what's going to allow us to either derive a string by using the grammar g1 or derive a string by using the grammar g2. Okay, so then we're going to define g. What is g? It has a set of variables. Its variables are all the variables from grammar 1 along with all of the, grammar, all of the variables from grammar 2 after replacement. So this was again ensuring that these two um, have an empty intersection. Also including this new variable s that we've just created. Okay, so that's the variables. I'm gonna put on the next line what the, oh, I can put it here. So sigma, our terminals. Okay. And then so that I have room, I'm just gonna put the rules on the next line. So the rules we're gonna use is all of the rules from grammar one along with all of the rules from grammar two after this replacement has occurred, along with this new rule that we just made, S goes to S1 or S2. Okay, that's all my rules. And then S was the start variable for the grammar. Okay, so what this allows us to do is when we have some string that we wanna find a derivation, we're gonna start at S and then we're going to either go to S1 or S2. Notice that S1 is just the start variable for grammar one. So then I can apply any rules from S1 to derive the string. Or I could instead replace S with S2 and use any of the rules in grammar two to derive the string. So G truly is, the language of G is the union of the language of grammar one and the language of grammar two, which is the same thing as L1 union L2. Okay, so that's our first proof. Let's do a second one just for practice. Let's call this proof two. Okay, so again, L1, L2 are context-free languages. Let's um, let the language of P1 be L1. So P1 is a PDA that accepts language L1. And the language of P2 is going to be L2. So PDA, P2 is a PDA that accepts language L2. So what we're gonna do is we're going to construct a PDA P for L1 union L2. Okay, how are we gonna do this? Let's think of our PDAs as black boxes. Uh, so this is P1, and let's say that its start state was Q0 sub one. Okay, I could relabel that to whatever its actual start state is, so that's not a problem. And this is PDA uh, P2, and its start state is Q0 sub 2. Okay, so we're going to construct our PDA P, and what are we going to do? We're going to have a new start state, Q0, and all it's going to do is not deterministically transition over to either Q0 1 or Q02. Okay. So some technical things that we need to be, so, so here, this whole thing is going to be my PDAP. 
All right, so some things we would need to be careful of. Number one, we just want to ensure that let's let Q1 be the set of states for P1 and Q2 be the set of states for P2. We want to ensure that that's empty. So they, do, they are disjoint. Okay, this just uh, makes it so that we can't mix and match, match transitions. So if I started in Q0 and I pop over to Q0 sub 1, I can't somehow be in P1 and then trans, so I don't want to be able to go over here and do some stuff over in P2. Okay, if I allow this to happen, then I'm not getting an actual union. I want the string to either be accepted by P1 or P2. Notice that it could be accepted by both, in which case we don't care which um, original transition we take. As long as, um, if it can be accepted by P1 and P2, then whichever uh, machine accepts it, that's fine. It's going to be in the union. Okay, so really that's the only technical thing that we need to be careful of. We need to make sure that we can't mix and match transitions willy-nilly. Okay, so I need a little bit more room. So if P1 was Q1 sigma R stack alphabet delta 1 Q01 and F1, and if P2 was Q2 sigma and F2, then what was P? P is going to be Q1 union Q2 union our new start state sigma union of our stack alphabets it's going to be the union of our delta functions along with some new transitions so I'm gonna run out of line um, yeah I'll just go down to the next line now so we're also going to have this transition from Q0 reading nothing I'm going to go to the set of states either Q0 sub 1 and push nothing to the stack, or I'm going to go to Q0 sub 2 and push nothing to the stack. Okay, so that should be all of delta. Q0, Q0 was our new start state. And what's the set of final states? It's going to be the union of the final states in P1 and the final states in P2. So basically, as long as the string can get to a final state in F1 using only transitions from delta 1, or a string can get to F2 using only transitions in delta 2, which we made sure of by making sure that we can't have any of this cross PDA interaction going on, then we're going to accept the string because it's in the union of P1, P2. Okay, so the language of P really is the union of the language of P1 and the language of P2, which was the same as L1 union L2. Okay, so these are two proofs. So uh, we've proved that context-free languages are closed under union. Okay, so you might be saying, we're supposed to be talking about complement. What does this have to do with complement? Well, we're also going to recall that, oops, that's not what I meant to write. Recall that context-free languages are not closed under intersection. Okay? So you might be thinking, hmm, union, intersection, complement, what does this remind you of? De Morgan, right? So we're going to use the fact that context-free languages are closed under union, but not intersection, to show that context-free languages are not closed under complement. Okay, we're going to do a proof by contradiction. So let's go ahead and assume, or suppose, that context-free languages are closed under complement. Okay, here and I'm just going to say 
for the purpose of obtaining a contradiction. Okay, so I'm not doing anything funny. Um, we're just going to assume that context-free languages are closed under complement so that we can get a contradiction. Okay, so then we have if L1 and L2 are context-free languages, it should be the case that L1 complement and L2 complement are context-free languages based on our above assumption. Okay, then it should also be the case that L1 complement union L2 complement that this language is a context-free language. Okay, we know we have closure under union, so if it's the case that L1 complement and L2 complement are context-free languages, then this absolutely has to be true. Okay, then we would also know that L1 complement union L2 complement complement should be a context-free language. Okay, I've just applied complement again. So if these context-free languages really are closed under complement, then I had assumed that L1 complement union L2 complement was a context-free language. Therefore, this whole thing complemented should still also be a context-free language. Okay, then we would have, let's apply to Morgan's, L1 complement complement intersect L2 complement complement. What is this equal to? Just L1 intersect L2 must be a context-free language. Okay, so, but we know that context-free languages are not closed under intersection. What does this mean? It means for arbitrary L1, L2, we cannot, oh, L1, L2 that are context-free languages. This is important. We cannot conclude that L1 intersect L2 is a context-free language. Okay, if we have closure under complement, then it must be the case that if L1, L2 are context-free languages, then we can do this chain and get that L1 intersect L2 must be a context-free language, and we know that this is not necessarily true. We have an example in another video um, where it isn't true, where the intersection of two context-free languages is not context-free. Okay, so this gives us our contradiction. So therefore, context-free languages are not closed under complement, and therefore that statement was false.